nice to see everybody. Um, I'm really sorry I can't be there in person. I flew back from uh, India on Sunday and um, unfortunately brought this subvariant of COVID with me. Um, so it is my second time having COVID in four months. Um, happily, it's not as bad this time, but maybe needless to say, I couldn't come in person in the center. Um, but I am eager to be with you all um, after a really meaningful journey. Um, I shared with some of you that I was going to Dharamsala and I got to spend some time with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who shared some incredible teachings. And um, I will look for the link, the office of the Dalai Lama, as many of you know, they live stream all the events that he holds there. And this was <clears throat> the first time in which he invited back a group of contemplative scientists, um, myself among them, to engage in dialogues that he's been doing for 35 years. So really nice to have this opportunity um, for a lot of the elders in that community and then those of us more kind of coming up um, to be in dialogue with His Holiness the Dalai Lama about the nature of consciousness and emotions and things that uh, many of us care about so deeply. So even virtually, I'm hoping to be transmitting some of that inspirational fire to you all. Um, and, you know, I'm, it's, it's good to be online because I get to feel what um, my Sangha members are feeling online. Being in person has just been such an amazing shift and change. So um, thank you all who are in the center together creating that Sangha. Um, and yeah, thank you those online as well. Just in case there are any folks who are new tonight and for all of us to remember, the San Francisco Dharma Collective is an entirely volunteer run center, which is a really unique and beautiful thing, especially in the increasingly capitalist extraction feeling world that we live in, in the Bay Area where everything costs something. And um, it's always for a certain purpose and to come together truly to share the Dharma and to teach and learn um, as a collective is just uh, priceless, I would say. It's an incredibly important goal for us that folks feel comfortable and connected in the center. And um, we know the hybrid situation can make that challenging. So we're always interested and open for suggestions and ideas on how we can improve the space so people feel that they can show up and they can practice and feel connected to one another. So please feel free to give us um, written feedback or email or chat with one of us. Um, this actually excludes a commentary on our technological setup because you know that's totally beyond our control. But psychologically, metaphysically, and spiritually, we can support you. <laughs> we are all in. Um, and yeah, for this evening, we're going to take a little bit of departure from the book um, to help us set up for next week. So um, just as uh, Mace was starting to mention, some of you know the neighborhood quite well and the Dia de los Muertos um, event has been going on in San Francisco, I think at least a couple decades, and it goes right down 24th Street, so right in front of the center. So it kind of precludes our ability to, to meet there. Uh, it will be a really uh, festive and busy evening. But it's really interesting to reflect on the kind of main theme that Dia de los Muertos kind of lifts up for us, this rejoicing. Um, this honoring, this remembering of ancestors. That can be folks who we've lost recently. Um, that can be folks who maybe we never even knew. And what's interesting about the event in San Francisco is, of course, it's a diaspora event coming from Mexico and then mingling with the San Francisco community here. And so you see a huge variety and creativity in the altars that are set up still with a um, intention for honoring. And one thing that happens when we honor and, and remember those who've passed is it makes us think about our own mortality and the fact that we too will be hopefully honored uh, and celebrated. 
and something we've done together as a sangha many times in the last couple of years is these four remembrances or this way of bringing in that understanding of mortality to our practice. But tonight we're going to do it a bit more explicitly and we're going to take tonight to really reflect on um, impermanence and get ourselves in some ways ready for the event next week. Um, so just a tiny aside, you know, next week there, if you haven't been to a Dia de los Muertos event, there's often a procession and a ceremony. And then there's many altars often, you know, I don't even know, maybe 20, 40, huge amount of altars that people set up. And anyone who wants to is invited to look at these altars and to resonate and reflect to what's being shared. So this year we are creating an altar that includes some themes and um, actual objects from a more Buddhist approach to understanding death and dying. And our hope is that you all um, can participate by either joining us or sharing with us someone you'd like us to honor and remember. So um, I think maybe Karen there has tonight some note cards for folks to write. At the end of our time tonight, I'll ask folks if they want to write into the chat so that we can, um, you know, write on a card and put on the altar. And this idea of when we think of loss and, and especially losing someone we care about, uh, as I think all of us either have or certainly will uh, um, at least once and then likely many times over, when it's our loss, when it's just our experience. It is just so much harder to hold than when it's all of our experiences together. And just such a important remembering of that kind of universality of loss that we can hold. Another thing that this holiday really brought up for me is uh, another book, don't worry, we're not gonna start another book yet, but another book, which I love, which is called A Year to Live. Maybe some of you have done this program with Vinny <clears throat> he's been, Vinnie Ferraro has been teaching uh, Year to Live as a year-long course. And it's just such a beautiful, very short book. I've actually listened to it on audio. It's like two hours. You can read it in an afternoon. Um, and it's by a teacher named Stephen Levine, who shepherded, I think, as he says, at least a thousand people in the last days of their life, sometimes the last months of their life and is a Dharma practitioner. And he created this book in some ways as a way for us to practice dying before we die. And to really help us kind of develop the skills and tools needed for us to die well. An interesting theme and thread is His Holiness the Dalai Lama was really bringing up this very issue. He uh, mentioned, which is of course um, visible and true, his, his body is getting older. He's 87 years old. And he says that the practices that he does every day ensures that his mind and heart keep getting younger. And I found that really inspiring. And he said that as well, that one of the most important practices for us as we all are preparing for death, which we don't know when it will come, is to really have a sense of being able to, as he says, rest in clear light. So we do those practices of open awareness and kind of resting in a sense of our awareness that isn't fixed to the body, that's fixed to this present moment of consciousness, but not to you know me as Eve sitting right here in my living room, wishing I was there with you all in person, but a sense of consciousness that is more open. Some of you are already familiar with that term clear light, but if you're not, it's maybe something you've touched in meditation where you have that sense of a dissolving. And when they're dissolving, it's not just nothing. There's, there's a light, the light of our own consciousness. Very beautiful, very hard to describe. Um, and can't promise you that we will uh, together point at it tonight, but we will do a practice that is one that uh, Stephen Levine suggests for preparation for dying. And it's one in which we really start moving towards one of the most difficult parts of moving towards dying, which is our fear. And in this practice, he suggests that we really work with the belly. Um, 
but a little bit more, His Holiness the Dalai Lama was saying that this practice of clear light or being able to connect to a sense of our conscious awareness, not bound by our body, that this is the very best practice we can do on a day-to-day -day basis to help us prepare for the end of life. And I think it's a inspiration for our practice, this knowing that there is something that we can be doing to kind of cultivate and forge the mind, the heart and the body, because the one thing we know is that we will die. Of course, we don't know when. And that fear of death, of course, by many philosophers, psychologists and otherwise is, you know, thought to be one of the main sources of kind of our neurotic habitual patterns that get us in trouble. So when we open to and open with this fear around dying, we can also loosen some of those habits, some of those patterns, some of those tensions that keep us really bound up. Not to say we shouldn't fear death. I mean, of course, like living is usually feels pretty preferable to most of us most of the time. But being able to work with and identify and to meet just with awareness, that fear, that's really something that I think the Buddha Dharma is especially well suited for. Um, so I wanted to give you a little uh, preamble there before we get into the practice. And I hope no one slips out of the room now that we're going to be talking about death and dying. But um, yeah, I just I think it's such a beautiful a beautiful invitation for us this time of year and with the celebration of Dia de los Muertos. I'm going to share a little bit here from this book before we do the meditation. Stephen Levine says, our fear of death is our fear of the uncontrollable unknown. It is the same old fear. It lies in wait behind our eyelids as we awake each morning. It is the fear of fears and it needs space to breathe. So in this practice um, that we're going to do here, it's, it's called, a, he calls it a soft belly practice. And um, I have a, a special connection to this practice. It, I was very fortunate that when my own mom was uh, transitioning out of this life a couple of years ago, she and I were reading this book together. Uh, and this was a practice that was really helpful for her. And she's not someone who really ever connected to a Buddhist practice, but this practice of a soft belly was something she could relate to, something she could engage with. And, and we did it almost every day together. So I'm really happy to be sharing it with you all. And um, he says that in our fear of death, what calls out first for examination is not death, <clears throat> but fear itself. We need to explore this hardness in the belly. That is so much part of the armoring over the heart. I'll say that one more time. We need to explore the hardness in the belly. That is so much a part of the armoring over the heart. There is a technique that is ideal for working with fear and letting go of holding. It is a soft belly meditation. An opening practice that dissolves resistance and increases the spaciousness in which the investigation continues. Don't let its simplicity dissuade you from plumbing its depth. As soft belly meditation develops into soft belly practice, it offers a further access to subtle blockages and eventually breakthroughs to our original spaciousness. And so how I understand this practice is it's one way for us to start moving towards that spaciousness of clear light. Some of us can just drop right in, you know, clear light, do the no method method of Dzogchen. But I, I think for many of us to really relax into that spaciousness is to go through the difficult emotion, a lot like the handshake practice that we often do together. So with that extensive preamble, please find a comfortable posture for practice. And give yourselves a moment to really settle in to the experience of being in the body in this moment.
And connecting to a sense of place. Whether in the center or in your home, just feeling a sense of the floor beneath you, the walls around you. And even beneath the floor to the ground and the earth. This earth, which has hosted so many beings before us. And connecting to a sense of the spaciousness through the sky. For those of us on the West Coast, the darkening sky, beautiful new moon. And this shift and transition of seasons, even here in California, the leaves are changing color. The angle of the sun has shifted. I'm just feeling that sense of place and of time. And then feeling that connection as Dharma brothers and sisters. here together tonight in this beautiful and unique gathering. It may never be the same, but for tonight, here we are connected through the practice, through these teachings. And we shift into the soft belly meditation. Take a few deep breaths and feel the body breathing in. And feeling the body breathing out. Feeling the expansion and contraction with each breath. And especially noticing the rise and the fall of the abdomen. Really inviting the energy from the head centers to descend into the belly. Inviting all of your attention and awareness to follow the simple rise and fall of the abdomen. And for the purposes of this practice, we could imagine this is our very last practice. 
We could practice as though our life depended on it. Let your awareness be with the beginning and the middle and the end of each breath as it expands and contracts through the belly. Notice how the sensations of breath are always changing. And invite a sense of relaxing and easing around the changes, breath by breath. Let the breath breathe itself into the belly, softening the belly. Soften the belly and receive the next breath. Receive the experience of shifting and changing in the body. Feel or imagine softening the muscles that have held fear for so long. Softening the tissues, the blood vessels, the flesh. Letting go of the holding of a lifetime.
deep letting go and softening the belly. Letting go and softening. Soften the grief, soften the distrust, soften the anger, all which may be held so hard in the belly. Softening and letting go, softening and letting go. Keep noticing if there's areas of hardness in the belly and keep softening, inviting these layers and levels of fear and distrust and anger, betrayal and hurt, letting them just soften and melt and be moved breath by breath. If thoughts come, simply let them come and then go, holding on to nothing, continuing to let go and soften. Be gentle with yourself, soften the belly, open the passageway to the heart.
in the soft belly, there is room to be born at last and room to die when the moment comes. In soft belly is the vast spaciousness in which we heal, in which we discover our unbounded nature, letting go into the softness, opening into our unbounded nature. Letting go into the gentleness, fear floats in the vastness that we call the heart. Softening and softening, opening and opening. Belly soft, heart open. Invite the clarity of the mind.
returning to reconnect deeply with the breath. And returning to reconnect deeply with our sense of place and space around us. And with this invitation that this meditation could possibly be our last, we use that as motivation to connect to Bodhicitta, our dedication of waking up our heart for the sake of all beings. As the only and most important thing we can possibly cultivate. Thank you for your practice. Very special to practice that with you all. Yeah, thank you. Would love to hear from folks, any reflections or questions on that practice. Uh, it is pretty much how he wrote it in the book, but I adapted it a bit. There's some words there and, and shifts but that's from Stephen Levine. Denise, I see your hand. I think someone needs to unmute you though. Uh, maybe I can. Aha, can I do? Oh, good. Hey, Eve, that was so fabulous. I was unfortunately having to drive during most of the meditation, but when you said our last meditation, I, I don't know if it's because you're coming back from the, Dalai Lama and all of his presence or the meditation itself or you know what you added to it but everything felt so different I mm -hmm. usually feel my head like a little bobblehead to relax and but in this case I had a sudden awareness and scanning and it was just very different and very serious and we should do this every day it was just so powerful mm -hmm. Thank you, Denise. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah, no, it really does. It is a perspective shift. Um, and it's not un impossible either, right? So yeah, thank you. Claudia. Yeah, uh, Eve, um, same thing. Well, when you said you know, do this practice as if this was our last one. All of a sudden, I felt really sad. Mm -hmm. Really sad. I mean, it's just like, it is such a precious practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the breathing and all that, that, I don't know, I just felt sad to think that it would be the last one. And then, um, when you say something about letting go of um, 
well, particularly the one that resonated with me, letting go of, of, of anger. Um, I don't know, all of a sudden it seemed to me like, oh my God, you know, in the big scheme of things, what a waste, yeah. what a waste. Yeah, and yeah. to think that, you know, we go for years yeah. sometimes, you know, being so angry and uh, I don't know, it just really, it really opened up also mm. a lot. Oh. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, it was. You. And, yeah, you know, I have. Te I have tears. I mean, I really it just. It was. Yeah. yeah. So it's and it and you know I've I've heard the distinction that teachers I really uh, respect say of like Dharma tears. You know, it's not oh poor me I don't want to die. It's oh no. wow the preciousness right. of right. it. Um. So that's so beautiful and Claudia. You know, I think for the altar, one thing I've been thinking of. It of course can be things and uh, people that um, that we're missing or laying to rest, but it could also be things we want to lay to rest, like anger. Mm. Well, that's a very good idea. Uh huh. Yeah. So I think that's a really it's a nice thing to have that sense of no, I I'm done. Like, uh -huh. Thank you for what you've done, and let's move on. So yeah, but thank you for sharing. Yeah. Thank you. Jason, I see your hand. Hi, I just re really um, feel the, the the connection to personally the the connection to practicing with somebody who's dying. I did that with my father. Um, it really uh, the Dharma is so helpful. Um, I was reading with him um, the Joy of Living as he lay dying. I mean, he was, he was literally on his deathbed and we were talking about this passage where he's, he was talking about physics and the Dharma. And it was like, mm -hmm. you know, really investigating this amazing quality and very detailed read, you know, paragraphs. And he was listening to the very end. So my very last memory of my father was him going, wait a minute, what was that last sentence? Let's go over it again. And, and we did meditate, but it wasn't like we, we didn't do soft belly. We were like engaging in this thought about life and death. So I just have this very profound sense of being with somebody dying. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I just wanted to comment on was how, um, you know, like this theme of boundless healing. You said uh, something around boundless presence, boundlessness. Uh, but as I was imagining, you know, when I'm sitting, I'm often very aware of my body. And then particularly in this one, I have a sore back and I have like creaky muscles and I feel a little bit under the weather. And I was like, the idea of boundlessness just became very like, mm. almost like, oh yeah. Almost like that would be such a relief, you know? Yeah. Just kind of, and I just thought about that as I was, you know, imagining that state, it, it really was uh, mm. quite new. Something, something kind of clicked. Yeah, wonderful thank you jason yeah and i think yeah it is it's so beautiful to be able to share the dharma with folks we love at the end if possible not always possible um and and i, I just want to point out what you're uh lifting up here which is that sense of boundlessness and um you know for any of you who've read the tibetan book of living or dying or um tibetan book of the dead you know, there is these very clear articulations of different steps of what happens with our consciousness and when our body, when they become decoupled. Um, and, you know, it's quite, quite interesting to um, imagine that process or visualize that process and in some ways actually kind of like prepare for that process. Um, and I think um, that sense of, of boundlessness is where Possibly, again, you know, only if this is something you um, feel drawn to investigate personally, but it's where our sense of consciousness is, is decoupled from the body, and we can touch that in practice. And one thing you hear, especially in the Dharma text, is that people, uh, as they face, you know, the last moments of life can become very afraid of the boundlessness. They start to get a glimpse of that boundlessness, and it's like, wait, what? I'm used to being confined in here, in like this level of duality of me and my direct, you know, my experience, my ruminations, and that can be really um, 
destabilizing. So when we practice this, it means that when we face, you know, the boundlessness, we will be less afraid, which again, what a beautiful thing to hope for um, and practice for. Um, yeah, thank you. How about folks in the room there on 24th Street? How are you all doing? Anyone want to pick up a mic and share anything? Um, I, I was just here to tell you that the thing. Can you hear this, Eve? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. Okay, I'm going to drag this over to Pamela. Thank you. Hi, Pamela. Hi, hi. Um, I was just coming in at the tail end of that meditation, and so I don't know the entire arc of what was going on, but when I arrived, uh, we were, uh, I perceived that we were doing the meditation kind of dropping into the belly and uh, breathing uh, was what I perceived. And that's what I attended to, um, which was interesting to me because I've been doing a lot of uh, bringing the awareness into the belly, like as a sort of practice. And um, one thing that I've noticed, it's been this kind of discovery channel thing. Um, I have a lot of like somatic body sensitivity and um, th that I've come to find, you know, to be an enjoyable experience of meditation, mm -hmm. um, especially like after doing lots of practices like handshake or whatever, kind of clearing the field a bit in the other areas of my body. But anyway, and the belly, as I'm practicing in that region with awareness, um, I have a, I, I had a, a, a myomectomy, right? So I had a, an abdominal surgery a long time ago now. Mm. And um, it's been very interesting because the sensitivity and the level of sensation is actually quite dull because of the, you know, the, whatever, the nerves don't function in the belly the same way that it functions in the rest of my body. And so um, I've had to bring more it's kind of an interesting thing because I think in the rest of my body, I'm so used to all of the sensitivity. And so there's an kind of an, there may have developed an expectation of experience, right? And then as I move into this part of my body where the sensitivity is just completely different, mm -hmm. um, it's like, it's like a totally new landscape. It's a totally new exploration of like, what does it mean? Like, what is it, what is having awareness and an area of your body that is essentially kind of numb in a lot of the place where I'm bringing awareness and what is like aware, like, it's just like, hmm. it's just, I wouldn't, I mean, I don't know. I don't, it's a common, I don't have any great thing beyond this to say. So anyway, I thought I would just share because I had been reflecting upon this earlier today in some conversations I was having and have been reflecting upon it and then to arrive into the meditation and have that be like, just of like, oh yeah, just in case you forgot about this piece <laughs> here, we're just really emphasizing it. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, the preamble was on preparing for death. So it was a little different. Um, and, uh, but I think nonetheless, it's interesting what you pick up on there because, um, in the book, Stephen Levine does say like, essentially how we are with our pain is a really good way to understand how we are with ourselves in our life. And so he gives this example of if you're moving through the room and you accidentally like whack your elbow on the side of a counter, do you, you know, curse yourself and say, okay, hey, like, God, why are you, you know, do you give yourself a moment to really feel it and take care of yourself? And just inviting us to bring awareness to how we meet our pain, um, or in your case, how we meet our numbness. Um, and, you know, do we give it the kind of careful attention as you're doing of 
hmm, what's this like? And how can I be with this? I think it's a really, I love that invitation. And another part um, is treating having a cold and, you know, modern update to the book, having COVID, um, treating it as though it is, you know, dying or preparation for dying. And so today, uh, working with this book, I was really thinking about like, wow, what if I wasn't going to get better? You know, what if this really was? And like really kind of lending your consciousness to um, to that and to, you know, as um, Claudia pointed out, to the grief of that, to the sadness of um, no longer being uh, part of the ongoing uh, linearity of the story of our life and our friendships and our people. Um, so interesting explorations. And I do think working with numb areas in our body or, or painful areas in our body is such a great um, place for the softening. So this practice so good for that as well. Yeah. I saw that Phil had his hand up. I don't know if he still does. Can you unmute now? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Well, welcome back, Eve. It's good to see you and um, hope you get better soon. And um, hello to everybody in our virtual Zoom circle here. Um, and th But I wanted to thank you for the soft belly meditation. Your version of it was lovely. It was, that is, um, I did the program, Year to Live with Vinny a couple years ago. And, um, you reminded me of us part of it that I had sort of like forgotten about that I really, really liked that yeah. soft belly meditation is um, uh, it's useful in a lot of ways, you know, just um, that, you know, intentionally making your belly soft and using your diaphragm to breathe. It's actually uh, helpful for digestive purposes and things like that. There's a physical component to it that is, is really, really helpful. And so um, thanks for the soft belly meditation and uh, that program, that year to live thing that Vinny, and now he's got a partner doing it, Frank. Um, what, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, if anybody has a chance to do it or look into it, 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 it's kind of beyond words for me to describe. Mm. You know, it's a lot about dying but it's also the name of the program, the name of the book is A Year to Live. Yeah. And the transformation, the trip that you go on over those 365 days is, um, it's amazing. Yeah. And um, so if anybody has any interest in doing that, and you get to learn the soft belly meditation. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, no, I think it's such a great, um, such a great program. And if you don't, have the time to do the program or the means, you know, you can do it with the book. It's so nice to do with the Sangha, but you can. And I've made a practice the last four or five years of reading this book um, in December at the end of the year and just kind of um, having it in mind. And I'm going to share, you know, some, um, some parts of the, of the book with us all tonight, because there's just a lot of really beautiful, um, beautiful parts of it. Um, I did see that there was, um, I did see that there was a question on the handshake practice. So that's a practice that often um, I will, will guide us through and it's a practice by Sokni Rinpoche. Um, and yeah, if I get a moment, I actually realize that there's a really wonderful free version of the practice um, from the Wisdom and Science of Emotions Summit last year in which Sokni Rinpoche describes and um, leads us through a handshake practice. So if I get a moment, I'll put it in the chat for you, Rose. Um, and I see the Dharma Collective has a hand up. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, this is Daniel. And I just wanted to share about my experience and to see if you had any um, comments. Uh, I found this very challenging. And for me, the best that I could do was to be with, to be with it and to try and practice not resisting that kind of tension 
in that area that I live with, that I've lived with, you know, for most of my life. Um, that kind of like what resists persists kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the best that I could do. And, um, and I wanted to see if you had any comments on that. Yeah. And so, so I understand it. Um, there was like being in the belly itself was like hard, like difficult, uncomfortable. Was that? The softening was very challenging for me. There was a little bit towards the end where I actually started to imagine um, actually like a cotton like material. I was actually thinking of something soft and that was helping a little bit, mm -hmm. but I felt like instead of being frustrated for the whole meditation that I wasn't, you know, that my belly wasn't softening the way that it should, that I would sort of allow myself to be with it the way that it is. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's yes, you got it. And I think, you know, in general, it is really, um, as I think, I think you already are on to is like, how can we more nakedly meet whatever our experience is? Um, and as you were mentioning, the kind of the resistance to it, it's like an attitude we have, like, oh, it should be different. Um, and it is really tough with, you know, especially if there's an area, um, like if you're being directed to the breath or to the belly, and, and that's a challenging place. That's, I think it's a especially kind of difficult um, circumstance to put ourselves into. But we can always, as I think you're mentioning, we can always work on like, how am I meeting this? Um, so in general, you know, my, my practices the last couple of days, maybe needless to say, haven't been as clear as they usually are, right? Um, especially the first couple of days, just feeling really draggy and dull. And um, I was catching myself just being really frustrated. Um, and what is the allowance then that I can make of like, yeah, you're sick you know, your meditations are not going to be that good right now. And, and that's okay. Or you're tired. And I think that whenever we can kind of find the attitude um, that we have towards ourselves when things are hard, there is an opportunity for real kindness, but we don't have to stay too long. It doesn't have to be a battle. And so I, I should have said this, but I will say it now, which is, you know, if the belly isn't working, you can really just reorient to another neutral place. Like for many people, just that's why he focuses on it. The belly is, like he said, the armor over the heart. It's where we like clench and there's a lot of fear and anger and just um, difficult unmetabolized material there. And so maybe we want to start by softening through the kneecaps or through the ankles and somewhere where it just there's less sensation, but we can still invite that practice of softening. How does that sound? Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I really love it when people are honest about the fact that the practice is hard or isn't working. Like You're never going to be the only person, and it's really useful to be able to bring that into the space. Um, I see another two hands here. I think, is it, Bill, is your hand still raised, or is it a new hand raised? Oh, okay. Maybe Daniel. <laughs> Hi, Daniel here. Um, thank you so much, Eve. I found uh, there was some real key things you said that, um, and I've normally, you know, I, I focus on my breath when I um, meditate and I focus on the pause at the end, you know, and I kind of fill that void right there with, with whatever, with nothingness, you know, where they just try to be there. But you said something really key and it was like, focus on the belly, which again, I don't think I've ever really focused on the abdomen itself. You know, there's been a choice between the nose or the tip of the nose or something in my abdomen. I always seem to pick the nose, <laughs> but um, you said, focus on your belly as though your life depended on it. And, you know, as soon as you said that, I really fell into this idea. Like I, what if I had to do that? What if I really had to focus on my belly in order to stay alive? And I'm telling you, I, I don't know what it is, but I mean, obviously it's in the air tonight, you know, but I recently had a, a very profound dissolving experience. And so I'm able 
to see the relativity. It's like, it's like sometimes it's like right at the tip of your nose and it's always been there in meditation, but just the enormity of it mm. without my ego involved mm. and the absoluteness of it was, um, was, was, you know, my load starts, like what I know I can shoot for, you know? And, mm. and um, so while I was doing that, focusing on my belly and doing it as though my life depended on it, I would, I, it wasn't like I was frantic, but it was like, this is really important. <laughs> yeah. And I fell into a really deep place and I found myself like, I don't know how long I was there, but I kind of went like that. I was nowhere and I just kind of came back out of it, you know, and then I had to recenter and stuff. But um, thank you so much. It's a great tool. I mean, this is the way I'm going to do this from now on. Soft belly, whatever you want to call it. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, it's that, that framing and, and, you know, truly our, our life does depend on it in a very practical way, right? Our reality is our perception. So how we see the world. And, and for many of us during meditation and, and during a lot of our waking life, we're perceiving the world through the veils of rumination and worry and regret, right? And, and we're living our life that way. Um, not all of us, not all the time, but we're maybe not as capable of bringing and holding our attention to whatever is happening in the present moment. And it is, uh, maybe needless to say, it's really compromising the quality of our life. So even if we're just ruminating about, just ruminating about the world, there's a lot of suffering in this world. Um, and it doesn't take a lot to get ourselves kind of caught into a pretty meaningful place of despair or worry. That has physiological impact on our body. That makes a really big difference on our overall health and well-being. And this is not to say that we should bypass and ignore and avoid what's hard, but that ability to choose what we focus our attention on is actually a life-saving ability. It'll preserve ourselves. It'll allow us to kind of be with in the moment what we need to be with and then place our attention elsewhere when it needs to be placed. And, um, you know, I, I really do think it is probably the most important thing we can be practicing for our own and others' well-being. So thanks for highlighting that, um, folks. And, you know, of course, if it's not easy, uh, it's still actually a good, um, it's still, not that it's still working, but it's still the practice, you know, the bringing back of our attention is just as important as sustaining our attention. So to not get discouraged if it's harder to stay there, we aren't feeling that. The coming back and the coming back is really good training as well. I'm going to read just one or two things and then Claudia, I will come back to you there. So I wanted to share this. Um, I really like the very introduction here. He says, this book or this practice of thinking about and really imagining and reflecting on if our, our life um, is a book of renewal. It's not about dying, but about the restoration of the heart, which occurs when we confront our life and death with mercy and awareness. It is an opportunity to resolve our denial of death, as well as our denial of life in a year long experiment in healing, joy and revitalization. He does say a little bit later that you don't need a year. You can do this in a month or a week or a day. So together we're doing it for a night, right? Of just really thinking about, um, wow, if this was our last meditation, if this was our last Sangha, What's the quality of presence that might you know, give for us and the kind of preciousness we might feel for this experience? Claudia, did you wanna? Try it now. There we go. Okay. Um... Yeah, I was going to ask you if you could explain a little bit more the connection between softening the belly and opening our hearts. But you just said something that was, I felt like it was really key when you said the belly is the armor over the heart. Yeah. And uh, it, it, all, of, all of a sudden, I mean, I, I am very sensitive in my belly and a lot of my emotions, whether it's 
fear, anger, whatever, I feel it in my belly. And so all of a sudden I realized that, oh my God, because you said something about that's where we clench, I guess. And so I just wanted to ask you if through this practice, is it that by softening the, the belly, we are becoming more vulnerable yeah. and, and therefore more in touch with our true mm. deep feelings and emotions. And I remember, I, I mean, I just remember during uh, the course of cultivating our emotional balance one time, I uh, was doing a meditation and, uh, and my belly was really soft, but then I felt a lot of fear because I, I was aware of that vulnerability. Yeah. Uh, and, and I kind of like stayed with that for several days, kind of, you know, just sent a question to yeah. the, the universe, the subconscious, and see why is this happening? Yeah. And I did get an answer, something emerged, you know, but mm. I, won't, I was wondering, if, is, that, is that the purpose? Is that it? That by softening our belly, we're more vulnerable and therefore more in touch with our emotions. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great question, which I feel like you you are um, exploring and answering. You know, just in in those reflections, and there's different systems. Um, you know, that will have different answers from traditional Chinese medicine and maybe more like subtle body approaches from Tibetan medicine. And um, if you look at Western medicine, we don't do that well with a lot of the gut issues. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of um, IBS is this crazy umbrella term for so many difficulties in the belly. But the one thing integrative medicine agrees upon is that there's a, a kind of, it's not just symptoms coming from your belly, right? That there is an actual um, psychosocial experience, right? Our heart and our head are involved. And so, now that we know that there are as many, if not more neurons in the belly as there are in the brain, at the minimum, we know that there's like wisdom in our belly. Mm -hmm. There's a knowing, there's an understanding. You know, it's so interesting. It's, you know, we, the food that we bring into our body is really like the most porous way that we're interacting with the world, right? Our digestive system. And it's just, this belly is an area where there's just so much kind of, um, you know, things that are metabolized or not. And if you look at these, you know, these wisdom traditions, like traditional Chinese medicine and, and other um, systems, of course, each of our organs has something else to, to share with us and teach us. And I think it's really useful, as you um, noticed, Claudia, is to notice when does our belly feel relaxed, if ever. Um, and I, I definitely have done that practice myself. And when my belly's relaxed, things are good. You know, like that is a time I, I like this idea of us being vulnerable. Like we know with, with kitties, right. They'll roll over and show us their belly when they're feeling safe and loving. And, um, that sense of kind of burying our vulnerable side. Um, and maybe it is that sense of I'm safe. I'm okay. And so when is it that our belly can feel at ease and, that might, might be when we're in the shower or when we're tucked in bed or right when we wake up, but it is a really great area to explore. So thank you for that. And I'll share um, a couple more quotes here from this book, which I really love. Um, he, really, he really says to us um, that the invitation to look at life as though it were our, our last month, or our last year, gives a person the power to heal that which remains unloved and unloving. Why wait for a terminal diagnosis before opening to the potential wonder of this living moment? No one can afford to put this work off any longer because almost no one, no one, no one of us knows on the day which is the last day. So that real, um, you know, that real kind of recognition of how important this work is. And again, it's just, it's like such good work um, for Dharma practitioners to do. You know, in the remembrances, we're thinking about this precious life, this precious human life that we are able, because of our sense faculties in this human body, to receive teachings, 
We live in a time of YouTube where we can receive teachings from all over the world. It's just outrageous. And while we have that amazing gift, we also know that these bodies get old, they get sick and they die. And that everything that we love, eventually we become separated from. And we also know that all of the actions that we're doing have a reaction. You know, these are, that's the first three remembrances. And then the fourth is, you know, what will really bring us joy is this inner cultivation. And it's so, and they're called the remembrances. And I think it's ironic because it's just so easy to forget. Like maybe even through our morning practice, we kind of hold in mind like, oh yeah, gosh, who knows what could happen this day? I should really focus on what matters. And then halfway through the day, we've forgotten. We've gotten in like some sort of silly fight or we're being judgmental or whatever else, right? So so hard to keep this alive for us. Um, yeah, and you know, I think I, I mentioned this earlier when I talked about um, how we can understand our pain as, as related to one another, but I, I wanted to share this passage. He says that pity arises from meeting pain with fear. Compassion is, comes when you meet it with love. When we attempt to escape from our pain, we feel a sense of helplessness. When we open to sensations at the very point of their origin, softening into an awareness that embraces rather than disclaims its momentary inheritance, we experience compassion and even gratitude. So I love this idea that this, when we attempt to escape from our pain, we feel helpless. When we open to it, at its very origin, that softening, that awareness, it's like an embrace. And that we can have compassion for our pain and even gratitude. He goes on to say, so as mentioning earlier, every time you're ill or have a headache, instead of turning on every appliance in the house to distract yourself, settle into the moment as it, as it is and soften around the discomfort. We have been conditioned to withdraw our awareness from the unpleasant, break that imprint. Whatever limits the entrance of awareness limits healing. Allow awareness to go where it may never have been before. Let it enter directly into the field of sensation, radiating from the discomfort. Soften and explore the constant state of change within the sensations. Send loving kindness wherever. Don't be embarrassed to have this much love for any part of yourself. So sweet. And I really, I love his focus on just the healing power of our awareness. You know, anything, again, anything we can meet nakedly with our awareness, no need to fix it, whether it's a numbness in the belly, whether it's a difficulty getting in the belly, can we use our awareness itself um, as a way to work with this comfort. He says, when we begin <clears throat> to respond to discomfort instead of reacting to it, an enormous change occurs. We begin to experience it not just as our pain, but as the pain. And it becomes accessible to a level of compassion, perhaps previously unknown. When it's the cancer instead of my cancer, I can relate to others with the same difficulty. And I can send compassion into the cancer rather than helplessly avoiding it, turning its pain into suffering. As this experiencing of the personal in its universal aspect develops, we feel a great weight lifted in what can be seen and now what can be seen as the mind. This idea of experiencing, you know, the personal in its universal aspect with our pain is so powerful. I feel like that's really such an essential part um, of meeting our fear, meeting um, our resistance in some way to our difficulties. Something, of course, we've talked about when we did Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life and so many other texts, you know, this is very core dharma, this idea of kind of de-reifying and um, depersonalizing our pain. But it's just such an important message for us. 
one other here I wanted to share. Let's see if anyone has any questions. <clears throat> he says, in our fear of death, what calls out first is for examination is not death, but fear itself. We need to explore this hardness in the belly. Um, and I, I just, this idea that the fear or the fear of death and dying, that that is the part that we are wanting to experience. And, and he goes into a lot of technicalities on the fact that there are such better regimens and protocols for pain maintenance at the end of life. And a lot of what we fear is actually discomfort. Um, and I think it's a bit more than that. Um, I had I, maybe some other people here too, but I, I've had a near death experience in the last couple of years. Um, I, it turns out I am deathly allergic to fire ants, um, anaphylactic, and so um, anaphylaxis. And so I was bitten by fire ants and almost died and happily didn't. Um, and in the actually months following that, I had a, a dream of dying, which I think is maybe not that uncommon. And in this dream, I had already died and I was looking at the world as someone who had recently departed. And I just felt so much longing to be part of the world. So much sadness to no longer be kind of involved in all the daily activities and things. And it was funny because it, it wasn't, I had already died in these dreams. I wasn't afraid of dying, but I realized that that fear is, is often covering just that great sadness that Claudia pointed to in the beginning of, wow, I don't want this to be the end. And so what happens if we start kind of really feeling into our fear and feeling into our fear it might soften into something more like sadness. And the fear, again, no problem, no problem with fear. But often that fear, that sense of threat or something coming can be so agitating to us and so upsetting. Is there a layer or a level deeper where we can just more touch that, that pain or sadness? And a place that's often easier for us to feel compassion is towards sadness. So just an invitation for us to kind of look at some of that, what is, you know, that sense of fear around death and dying that of course we all have, and is especially compounded by the fact that we live in a society where we just don't talk about it. Um, we don't see it. It's kind of removed from us. It's very hard to really gain access to an everyday familiarity and understanding of what it's like to be around death and dying. I, I've shared with folks here before, I think my best education was in SF General as a, um, as a night social worker because I got to see a lot of death and dying on a nightly basis. And it didn't make it any easier, but it made it a lot more understandable that this is a life that includes death and dying. And that's not something um, many of us are able to or encouraged to think about and reflect on and kind of harvest the richness of and also diffuse some of the anxiety around. So curious, folks have any thoughts or questions on kind of how to bring this into the path or what other reflections might come up? I feel like I see Jimmy thinking even. Oh, nope, I see someone even behind. Yes. Here after. Uh, this is Tom at the center. Hi, Thank you for all of that. And I just, that, bringing that up, it really brought forward, I think, an, also the uh, vulnerability of the soft belly brought up for me that I've had a very um, a person very close to me who's been kind of chronically suicidal for many, many years. And um, for this person, there's a feeling that, um, you know, death is an answer in a certain way. It's sort of like, an, it's sort of like, finally, I'll get to escape from this, you know, this horrible pain, which I've very much tried to empathize with and tried to visualize and understand and, you know, to try to relate to because without that, I feel so helpless. And the helplessness is like, there's anger there because I don't, you know, there's a sort of fundamental way that I feel disturbed by it. And I don't, I can't do anything about it. It feels like I've tried to fix it. And 
many, many ways and, and realize that that's not helpful at all to anybody. Um, and then to, and then I do think that there's a deep sort of sadness that's really, um, you know, when people talk about boundlessness, it sort of feels like there's a kind of boundless sadness mm. that has to do with this moment. And in a certain way, it, it feels like it, um, you know, I kind of bounce back and forth between it makes it feel very precious. Like, mm. who knows if this is the last day I'll be able to talk to this person mm. or if this is the last thing I'll be able to, to say to this person, which makes it all very, mm. you know, sort of almost too meaningful because, right. you know, if you sort of say, you know, you can't say something like sarcastic or facetious or make a joke or, or think, oh my God, suppose that's the last, you know, so there's this way in which it just, right. it feels like it's very, um, ties me up in a knot, I think. And I think a lot of that is really my, when I think about stomach and belly and hardness and tightness, and I think a lot of it is wrapped up there. And I just don't, um, I don't know. I just, when you said that, I just was wondering if you or other people had thoughts about how to, um, how to be open to not my own death, which, you know, I'm not, you know, I don't really feel one way or another, but it feels like, okay, whatever. But the death of somebody who I feel, the potential death of yeah. somebody who I feel very close to and is very important to me. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And um, yeah, my heart really goes to this person you're describing and, and that struggle of not being sure that life is worth living, you know, and, um, and that the pain of this life is, is, is so great that not living feels like a, um, right. a better alternative. You know, that's of course not an uncommon experience and, and a lot of people suffer that way. And I think your, your question points to even like a, a greater piece, which is some, some of us might feel like my own death, like, okay, whatever, but oh gosh, this beloved person, that, that really, like that is where the squeeze really starts for us. And um, I think that's a really beautiful reflection and, and another way that we can kind of work with that vulnerability you're describing, because it is true. We have, of course, no control over our own death, but even less over others, right? right? And, and those we love. And, you know, it's um, for those of us who had a, a close loving relationship with our parents, it's, it's like, you think about it, like what a setup, you know, these people who love you the most in the world potentially very likely going to be leaving earlier than you like who created this right like what a what a what a crazy setup for us all um and i think there is or there can be this invitation to um seeing what you're describing which is the potential boundlessness of sorrow seeing both that that boundlessness actually isn't um isn't like an abyss but it is in some ways like an ocean. Um, and there's a lot to learn from our sorrow. I mean, needless to say, some of our, our greatest inspirations can come when we are you know, recovering or in heartbreak itself. And then I will just speak experientially and, and also from what I've read that that fear of like a kind of unending sorrow um, can really hold us from dipping into our grief or our sense of helplessness. But what I've noticed in my own practice and what I've read from teachers is there is that moment where it feels endless. And then there's, it, it comes through to another side. And it isn't, you know, the, what Chogyam Trumpa calls the unconditioned heart of sorrow is not actually a place of abyss, but a place of real strength. Um, it's very interesting. And it, it's easier in a way than the limited sense of the sorrow that we're trying to just hold into ourselves. It's like when we can step slightly outside of the sorrow that we're experiencing for ourselves or for others and instead get that kind of universal sense of sorrow, that that's when it opens up to this spaciousness and not this dislike experience. So just as an invitation. Um, of maybe how to be with that sense of sorrow is opening up to though no one might have exactly your experience how so many of us suffer in the same way and that there's such a liberation in that kind of um, collective sense of compassion so, thank you that's helpful yeah um 
amazingly, we are at time here. Such a, a rich um, evening. Sorry for my congestion, but I'm so glad I could be with you all. So let's take a moment and really dedicate the merit of this time together. So closing your eyes, if that feels appropriate and bringing your hands together towards the heart and just a posture of offering. And connecting to the belly and the heart and the head. And feeling just the presence of the body in this moment. And allowing the heart to really blossom into this, this sense of offering that anything we may have gained or benefited from tonight, anything that may be growing within us as a transformation, and we dedicate all of this in the hope and aspiration that all beings could know their deathless nature that all beings could feel comforted in their fear, that all beings could experience the richness of sadness and compassion, and that all beings could be free. Thanks everyone. So we won't be in person in the Dharma Center next week. We will be in the park um, and there's information about that on the website, how to get there. And for folks in the center tonight, please feel free to write down any names that you'd like us to include on the altar. And for folks online, if you wanna add any names for us to include on the altar, um, and for those who feel comfortable and interested, we would love to see you. We'll be there from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. And we'll have like big kind of Tibetan Buddhist uh, inspired altar. So yeah, be really great. <laughs>